We're going to go ahead and begin the awards ceremony now. And please feel free to continue to eat your lunch. The awards ceremony is a major event for ECS as we honor a series of people who have done amazing things in education policy, some over the past year, some over a lifetime. And to begin the awards ceremony, I'm honored to welcome Governor Sandoval back to the podium. Please join me in welcoming Governor Sandoval. And before we get started, could we all give a big hand to the Capitol Hilton staff for this wonderful lunch? Very good. Now, before I commence with the award ceremony, I'd like to make an announcement. Yesterday at our annual commissioner's business session, the ECS commissioners elected the next chair of this organization, and it was a very close vote. He, very, he skated by with a unanimous vote, but I'm pleased to um, introduce the chair-elect, Governor Steve Bullock from the great state of Montana. No, and I think you'll find that uh, Governor Bullock is a fierce, fierce advocate for education. He's somebody that I've come to know through the Western Governors Association and the National Governors Association. I have a profound respect for him and what he's done for the citizens of Montana, and he will be an amazing leader for this organization as well. Governor Bullock. Thank you, Governor Sandoval, and thank you all for, I guess, the commissioners who elected me, uh, giving me the honor and the privilege to get to serve as the next chair-elect, and at some point soon fill Governor Sandoval's very large shoes. You know, I come to this position, though, as more than just the governor of Montana. As an illustration, I think I was about two weeks into this public housing that we call the governor's residence in Montana. And we're preparing for some reception, and the soccer ball whizzes by my head. It doesn't hit me. I'm like, boy, I dodged another bullet. Bounces off a wall, and this, uh, the residence manager kind of nervously says, you know the painting that was just hit? is about twice as much as you make a year in value. And it, it sort of underscored to me that it had been 40 years in Montana since kids my age, I have a 12-year-old, a 10-year-old, and a 7-year-old, had been part of this whole deal, and um, that the house is going to have to make some adjustments. And truly, for anybody serving an elected office, that you know that really your public priorities are shaped by your private experiences. And with kids as young as they are, it's those three kids and kids like them across Montana and the nation that really drives my efforts to both improve educational opportunities and believing that every child, regardless of their background, regardless of their income, regardless of their geographic location, really ought to have that opportunity uh, to fulfill their potential. Every day when we send our three kids off to school, it serves as a reminder of the great things that are happening across our state and our nation. But it's also a reminder to me of all that much more that we need to be doing. If we really are are concerned about building that workforce for the 21st century, we need to be focusing on those employees not when they're entering into the economy, but when they're entering into the world. And that's one of the reasons why, be it a college dean, be it a high school teacher, be it so many others, really are now focusing on what we're doing between zero and five, and we do need to be making those investments in early childhood education. I think we need to ultimately all of us be removing the impediments to keeping a child from learning. Simply stated, if a child is more focused on where they're going to get their next meal, it's hard to sit still, it's hard to pay attention to math class, and food insecurity is an issue that's actually, unlike so many we grapple with here, is solvable. We just feed kids one after another. 
And what we're making, I think, great strides across the country in reducing dropout rates. But great strides aren't necessarily enough. And we need to make sure, because any child that we lose through high school is one child too many. And that's both incumbent upon us and incumbent upon the greater community. My favorite superintendent of schools uh, in the country, and indeed the world, is Denise Juno, the Montana superintendent. <laughs> Denise started a program called uh, Graduation Matters that really engaged the whole community and realizing that these aren't statistics, these are potential successes. And she's done that on a community by community basis. So I think that communities have a role to play in dropout rates, as well as the students, certainly, but as well as us, all of us in education, to make certain that students have access to challenging, relevant, interesting classes that are going to keep them engaged throughout. We need to make sure that no matter where a child lives, be it in rural Montana, or urban Nevada, that they have those same opportunities um, to gain both the same skills and to pre prepare them to be competing. And part of that's what we do in education, and part of it's the infrastructure around it with technology and other issues. We need to really be making certain that every student in our high schools recognizes that they're college material, even if they've never been told they might be able to as we push more for dual enrollment opportunities to engage students to say, you know, you could make it in advanced degrees, I think that's that much more critical. We also have to make certain that we're preparing those kids for higher education as well. Again, my favorite superintendent started making ACTs available for all. So every student can basically have that gauge to say, here is where I'm lacking, here's where I can do more. I think that's very constructive. We need to rethink how we're doing workforce development. So instead of just focusing on the th theoretical approaches, we're actually bringing our colleges and private employers together to talk about what skills are going to be needed. I've said to all of my higher ed folks throughout the state, I never want to lose a potential employer in Montana because they say, we'd locate here if only you could guarantee me the pipeline of workers. And we need to ensure that when students are entering college or university, they're able to actually complete their degree, complete it on time, and not be buried with necessarily a mountain of debt. I'm excited about the work that you all and leaders like Governor Sandoval are doing to tackle these issues. These are difficult issues, but there's probably nothing more important than we can do in the arenas of public policy than really shaping the future for that next generation. Working together, I know that I, along with millions of other parents, each morning as we send our kids off to school, that we can do so with confidence, knowing that our little ones are gaining both the skills they need to be successful, not only in, in school, but also in life. I really appreciate uh, the honor and privilege of getting to next lead this organization. Thank you for the confidence, and I hope that I ultimately will live up to it. Thank you, Steve. And uh, again, we look, I look forward to working with you, and we all look forward to your leadership. So now let's begin the award ceremony. First, I'd like to mention an award that was given out yesterday. Some of you know that ECS and the National Conference of State Legislatures have partnered for many years on the Legislative Education Staff Network. If you are a legislator or no one, you know how hard their staff work. Each year, the Legislative Education Staff Network recognizes a legislative staff member who has provided exemplary service to the legislative process. This year, they recognized Connie Steffen, Senior Poly Policy Analyst with the Utah Legislature. Connie is retiring this year after serving in the Utah General Council for 29 years. <laughs> I 
You know, I think I've never been in a job more than four years. So that's uh, <laughs> after, um, with the last 14 years as the lead policy analyst in education. She is one of the state's foremost experts on school finance and is also a prolific bill drafter, even though that is not a primary responsibility for analysts in Utah. Connie's nomination for this award came from multiple state legislators who praised her for her integrity, for acting like a trusted advisor with a wealth of knowledge, and for being one of the most creative and innovative policy analysts out there. One legislator said, and I quote, it is because of Connie that I am as successful as I am as a legislator. We're gonna have to recruit you to Nevada. <laughs> Ms. Steffen, could you please stand and be recognized? Congratulations on receiving the award. And now we'll move to the ECS Awards. Each year at the National Forum, ECS recognizes states and individuals who have made significant contributions to education in the United States. We have two awards to give out today. The first is the Frank Newman Award. The late Frank Newman served as ECS president for 14 years. In 2005, ECS created an award in his honor that recognizes states or territories for innovation and excellence in education policy. The ECS nominating and steering committees look for the following criteria making their selection for this award. Education improvement efforts that are bold, recoupable, and hold valuable lessons for other states and efforts that have been bipartisan and have broad-based support. This year, ECS selected the state of Illinois for its collaborative work to improve the preparation and certification of school principals. In 2005, Illinois embarked on a path to improve principal training because of growing concerns about the quality of higher education programs that prepare school leaders. Over the next several years, they brought together stakeholders from K through 12 education, early childhood education, colleges and universities, state agencies, the business community, and education organizations to create broadly supported policy recommendations. The result of these efforts was the bipartisan passage of a groundbreaking law in 2011 that required universities to redesign their principal preparation programs. Under the new law, higher education programs that train principals must create more rigorous admission requirements, provide courses and internships that provide experience across the P-12 continuum, including early childhood programs, address students with special needs, including students with disabilities and English language learners, require intensive performance-based internships that match candidates with high quality mentor principals, and finally to forge partnership agreements with school districts. In addition, the principal license was changed from a general administrative license to one that is more focused on the skills principals need to be an effective school leader. The result of their work has put Illinois in the national spotlight. The state has been sought out by other states that want to learn more about the reforms and garnered the recognition of national organizations such as the National Conference of State Legislatures and the National Governors Association. They embody the spirit of the late Frank Newman and are so deserving of this year's Frank Newman Award for State Innovation. Here to accept the award are State Superintendent Christopher Cook, Harry Berman, former Executive Director of the Illinois Board of Higher Education, James Applegate, current Executive Director of the Illinois Board of Higher Education, and Erica Hunt, Senior Policy Analyst at the Center for the Study of Education Policy. Congratulations to you all.
Thank you. This is, this is quite an honor to accept today. And um, we're accepting it on behalf of all of us on the stage, but I do want to recognize um, so many people that were instrumental in this work, many of which are in the, the room here, um, because this was a grassroots um, reform effort that started in Illinois in 2006. Yeah, 2006. Um, and with the patience and support of the Wallace Foundation and Richard Lane and, and Jody Spiro, we were able to fully engage the field in the conceptualization and design of this work, including piloting um, principal preparation programs that are effective and documenting the effectiveness and results of it um, to be able to shape policy. So we know that policy takes time, but it, it does take a lot of patience and support. And I'm just gonna name a couple of the organizations that were really instrumental, um, including in the room, um, NCSL, um, NASB, um, CCSSO, SREB, NGA, AIR, but statewide we had the um, unrelenting support of our unions, IEFT, IEA, um, the Large Unit District Association, um, universities like University of Illinois Chicago and New Leaders for New Schools and Illinois State University that were willing to champion and test this innovative approaches, and school districts that were willing to stand up and um, voice concerns for principal preparation and be part of the solution in finding these, including Secretary Duncan, who was one of our first champions in the state, um, and also um, Springfield School District. So these are just a few of the, the organizations and, and advocacy organizations like Advance Illinois, and Ounce of Prevention, Latino Policy Forum, but this just shows you how broad reaching this effort was and why it took so many years to do this work. We do know, though, that um, once legislation, and pass, legislation is passed and rules are developed, that that is not the end of the road. So we've been very fortunate in Illinois that we've had foundation support from the McCormick Foundation to do technical assistance to universities and helping them adapt to these new changes because these changes were um, significant. We got right to the core of um, higher education and challenged some of the assumptions that are very valued in, in higher education, um, including our internship, which is competency-based. So you have to de de demonstrate a mastery and, over and able to, to pass the internship. Um, a strong district university partnership requirement, where we looked at the districts as consumer to this work, and the district having a real role and ownership of this. And then as we said, we expanded this through this P20 vision of a P-12 endorsement where principals have to get experiences in early childhood settings, elementary and secondary. And we came across this idea. This idea was brought to us by the early childhood field that found that the principal was the number one barrier to many of these transition efforts that, were trying to, that they were trying to make with early childhood and elementary schools. So we know listening today at this conference and, and yesterday that so many of the initiatives we're discussing really depend on the principal, um, whether it's student and teacher engagement, whether it's um, kindergarten transitions, or whether it's um, common core implementation and teacher evaluation. So um, it's really essential that we focus and continue to focus on, on the principalship with this. Um, I gave you an example of how we've done um, implementation support with this work, and we also have just received funding from the US Department of Education to test the internship model. So we're continuing to learn on this. Um, we're doing a, a semester buyout for teachers and uh, the evaluator is air so we can see if a semester buyout can produce uh, measurable outcomes. And that's a much more um, scalable version of what we can do for the internship. And the McCormick Foundation has also just um, funded two independent organizations in Illinois to do a study of the implementation of our principal preparation programs. So though the policy is passed and is written into law, we know that much more support needs to happen with the implementation and studying it through a continuous improvement lens so we can make sure that if there are unintended consequences from this, we address that, but that we also continue to leverage resources and support to do this work. Um, I'm gonna do one last thing before I conclude though, and I'm gonna do a little mom moment here, and I wanna introduce um, my two children there. Um, I have my son, Kale, here, and I have my son, Ari. I my, sorry, my daughter, Ari. Um, <laughs> do you guys want to wave? But I just want to say part of the... <laughs> yeah. Um, they're the inspiration 
to me and my work, but children were the benchmark to our work in Illinois, and that's why we could leverage the changes that we did, because at all of our meetings, we collectively always said, is this best for kids? And when we were challenged on issues, we asked the question, is this because it is harmful to kids? Or is this because it's hard for us to change our adult behaviors? Or is there another reason for this? And if it wasn't what's best for kids, um, we kept pushing for what was best for kids. Um, I can say honestly, I think we're on the right path right now with the changes that we did with principal preparation. And now for the second award. The James Bryant Conan Award is named after one of ECS's founders, a man who began his career as a brilliant scientist and ended it as one of the nation's great education reformers. Since 1977, the James Bryant Conan Award has recognized individuals who have dedicated their career to improving American education. We have a special video to tell us more about the award and why ECS named it its highest honor after Mr. Conant. Before the video begins, we would like to take this opportunity to thank Pearson for providing the financial support to produce the video. Their support and commitment to our work is invaluable. Big hand for Pearson, please. And now with the video. Each year since 1977, the Education Commission of the States has honored the memory of its co-founder, James Bryant Conant, by bestowing an award in his name on an individual who has made outstanding contributions to American education. For almost a half century, Conant was a pivotal figure in the making of our nation's scientific, foreign, nuclear, and education policy. He worked and moved among the titans of his time. With Mr. Dulles, American Ambassador Conant left, and German Ambassador Kreckler, Dr. Radenauer meets with the President. He was engaged in many of the great events, issues, and struggles of the 20th century. The democratization of American higher education, the development of the atomic bomb, the reconstruction of post-war Germany, the Cold War, the battle for academic freedom during the McCarthy era, school desegregation, and social unrest in America's cities in the 1960s. Conant once observed that four entangled strands wove the pattern of his adult life. Chemistry, Harvard, Germany, and education. Born in 1893, Conant grew up in a working-class suburb of Boston, the son of a photo engraver. An inquisitive boy who showed an early interest in science, Conant blossomed into a brilliant student who entered Harvard on a scholarship at 17. After earning his doctorate at the age of 23, he joined the Harvard faculty as a chemistry instructor. Within a decade, he was a full professor, a department chairman, and one of the best organic chemists in the country. In 1933, Conant, just 40 years old, was offered the presidency of Harvard by a board of trustees convinced of the need for a vigorous, forward-looking leader. Over the next 20 years, Conan transformed Harvard into the most prestigious university in the nation. He reformed admissions policies and created scholarship programs to build a more geographically and economically diverse student body. He raised standards for faculty appointments and tenure and initiated graduate degrees in education, public policy, and the history of science. He created interdisciplinary chairs to encourage scholars to transcend their specialties and championed the admission of women to the medical and law schools. As the Nazis rose to power in Germany, Conant became an outspoken advocate for rearming America for the war that he saw as inevitable. In 1940, President Roosevelt, who had grown to rely on Conant for advice, assigned him to head the effort to mobilize American science and technology for war, including the ultra-secret Manhattan Project. In 1953, Conant resigned as president of Harvard to become U.S. High Commissioner to Germany and later American ambassador to West Germany under President Eisenhower. When he left Germany in 1957, 
Conan was nearing retirement age. But for some time, he'd been gearing up to begin yet another career as full-time author, commentator, and critic on American education. I believe our system of public education is one of the unique features of the society which we have developed on this continent. The development of local groups working for their schools is potentially the most important move in the past 50 years for the advancement of elementary and secondary education. With the support of the Carnegie Corporation, he assembled a team of PhD-equipped assistants and devised a research agenda for a year-long study of American high schools. Conant rejected the European approach to secondary education, in which only 20% of students were chosen for pre-university schools. A modern industrial nation, he argued, needed more than a few brains. It had to uplift talent at every level. Conant and his research team set out in search of schools that met his definition of a comprehensive high school. But in a year of inspecting 55 schools in 18 states, he found only eight that even came close. Most schools required only two years of instruction in English and paid meager attention to teaching students to write. Girls shunned math and science, while boys avoided English and foreign languages. All down the line, Conan found academically talented students were not being sufficiently challenged. Conan published his findings in 1959 in a best-selling book entitled The American High School Today. The book made front-page news in papers across the country, sparked reforms and experiments in schools across the nation, and inspired a glowing Time magazine cover story that hailed Conant as the Inspector General of U.S. Education. Basically, after the Russians launched Sputnik in October of 57, uh, the high school book came out, the American High School, so context and timing are very important, and the public schools were under tremendous pressure and criticism. Uh, we were second in the space race, science, math, foreign language, and here you had this, uh, this individual uh, coming from a whole different cut of American society in terms of influence and power and prestige, paying attention to public schools, visiting public schools, visiting school teachers and principals and small towns and hamlets as well as in big cities all over the United States. And it was a tremendous uh, boon, if you will, to the enterprise. Two years later, Conan published Slums and Suburbs, in which he tackled the controversial subject of race and education. I am convinced, Conan warned, we are allowing social dynamite to accumulate in our large cities. He called for massive and speedy federal aid to inner city public high schools to improve conditions for students. Over the next few years, Conan studied and promoted reforms in teacher education, was a leading advocate for federal support of public television, and penned a memoir, My Several Lives. One of his last books, Shaping Educational Policy, served as a blueprint for the Education Commission of the States, an interstate compact created in 1965 to help states work together to improve education policy and policy making. His own thinking about creating uh, the compact or the commission of the states was the fact that there was a desperate need for policy makers, governors, legislators, educational policy makers to find a single place where they could pool and share information, etc. that would not be a centralized single force for homogenizing policy. Shortly before Conan's death in 1978, the Education Commission of the States established the James Bryant Conant Award. Over the years, its recipients have included trailblazers and innovators. David Gardner, Thurgood Marshall, and Benjamin Mays. Joan Gans Cooney, Fred Rogers, Marion Wright Edelman, Fred Heckinger, Ron Wolk, and Ted Coldery. Authors of Landmark Initiatives. Rhode Island Senator Claiborne Pell. Illinois Governor John Stell. Kentucky Congressman Carl D. Perkins. And Indiana Congressman John Bradamus. Champions of Reform. In Higher Education. Ernest Boyer. 
John Gardner, Frank Newman, in teacher education, John Goodlad, in K-12 education, James Comer, Robert Moses, Ted Sizer, Robert Slavin, Ralph Tyler, Katie Haycock, Linda Darling Hammond, E.D. Hirsch, Jean Wilhoyt, and Mark Tucker. And in early learning, Sharon Lynn Kagan, state and federal leaders, Governors Lamar Alexander of Tennessee, Roy Romer of Colorado, Terry Sanford, and Jim Hunt of North Carolina, and Gaston Caperton of West Virginia, Texas Representative Wilhelmina Delco, Maryland Superintendent of Schools Nancy Grasmick, and U.S. Commissioners and Secretaries of Education Francis Keppel, Harold Doc Howe, Terrell Bell, and Richard Riley. The award is an honor for two reasons. One, that uh, the leaders of the Education Commission of the States has identified a person uh, on whom to bestow it. But secondly, because of Mr. Conant. Um, the ECS is very much the long shadow of thoughts of Mr. Conant. Um, he was critical in its founding. But it's more than that. He was a, a deeply humane man who believed equally deeply in democracy and saw the public schools as the great engine for preparing all citizens for their civic duties and their opportunities to get ahead. The Education Commission of the States is proud to present its annual award for outstanding service to education in the name of James Bryant Conant, whose life and career were distinguished by vision, energy, courage, and a passionate belief in political liberty, social justice, and the transformative and enduring power of education. an extraordinary video. Next year, 2015, marks the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Education Commission of the States, which was Dr. Conant's idea. You, want to, you won't want to miss the meeting next year, which will be in the great state of Colorado in Denver. And now for this year's recipient, the 2014 winner of the James Bryant Conant Award is Mark Tucker. Mr. Tucker is the founder, president, and CEO of the National Center on Education and the Economy. Mr. Tucker has spearheaded some of the most important education reforms of the last 25 years. His influence started in the 1970s while he was at the United States Department of Education and directed national research on issues such as education equity, education finance, assessment, and instructional practices. He later organized several important national task forces and authored groundbreaking reports that have had a lasting impact on education. I will share just two of the many examples today. He organized a task force on teaching as a profession and wrote their influential report, A Nation Prepared Teachers for the 21st Century. This report led to the creation of the National Board for the Professional Teaching Standards, which has since certified thousands of accomplished teachers in the United States. Tucker has long argued that the United States will not have a world-class education system until teaching attracts top high school graduates and becomes a high-status profession. He created the Commission on the Skills of the American Workforce and wrote their report, America's Choice, 
high skills, or low wages. This report led to the creation of the New Standards Project, which brought together 17 states who agreed to, set a, who agreed to a set of academic standards and examinations. These standards were a precursor to the Common Core state standards. Mr. Tucker's dozens of articles and books are widely read for their insights and innovative thinking. He recently produced a report at the request of Secretary Arne Duncan and the OECD on lessons learned from the PISA survey. He also recently edited the book, Surpassing Shanghai, which answered the question of how the United States can compete with the top performing countries around the world. Mr. Tucker has spent his career working to make our educational system the best in the world. He truly, truly embodies the late Dr. Conant and for this, we are honored to give the 2014 James Bryant Conant Award to him today. Mr. Tucker. Thank you, Governor. This was, I must say, a quite unexpected honor, for which I am deeply grateful. There are a few of us who would not be touched by this sort of recognition for our life's work. It's customary on such occasions to acknowledge the support that we've received from our family and from our colleagues. But that would be a little misleading here. In the case of both my family and my colleagues, we all have our strengths and our weaknesses. To the extent that we've achieved anything worth achieving, it's because we are a team. Yes, I have their support and they have mine. We support each other. We have each other's back, as they say. We set high standards for ourselves and we know that we can accomplish more together than any of us can individually. To my family and to my colleagues, I say thank you for everything you do to make our lives together so rewarding. Well, apropos of the film we just saw, I'm about to stick my neck out. I would be less than honest if I did not tell you that I come before you a little dispirited. Years ago, Corelli Barnett, a British historian, wrote a book titled The Pride and the Fall. In it, he explored the causes of the greatly reduced standing of Britain following World War II. He had expected to tell a story about the failures of foreign and military policy, but as a good historian will, he followed the evidence where it led him. And it led him to tell a story about the failure of Britain to build a modern education system. It was not for lack of evidence of decline. It was not for lack of clear warnings of the danger that Britain faced if it failed to build the kind of education system that its competitors were building. There were plenty of warnings from commission after commission. I'd like to read to you from the preface that Corelli Barnett wrote to the American edition of his book. This book, he said, portrays a great nation, which even in the pride of apparent world power was already rotting toward its fall. It portrays a nation blinded by that very pride to the signs of decay, of its strength. The book documents how Britain failed to match the education and training efforts at all levels being made by her challengers to supply the highly skilled and motivated workforce and professional management essential for continued industrial success. It reveals how these factors of poor education and training compounded with appalling urban living conditions to produce a workforce in no way a match for the competition in terms of developed intelligence in capability. And finally, the book analyzes how and why this outwardly still great nation and world power failed to embark on the necessary profound adaptation of itself as an industrial society, and so by default led the way clear for the fall that was to come after the pride. Although this history concerns itself with a particular nation in a particular time, other nations in other times might profit from the moral. When it was published, 
The Times Literary Supplement said of Barnett's book the following. It has a cutting edge, they said, rare in academic writing, because its author is clearly in a towering rage. And so am I, and for much the same reason. I commend to you another book, The Race Between Education and Technology, by two Harvard professors, Claudia Golden and Larry Katz. In it, Golden and Katz describe a glorious history. They show how the United States led the world through the 19th century in providing a free, public, basic elementary school education to the ordinary people of American society on a scale never before seen in the world. Then they show how, in the first half of the 20th century, we again led the world in education, this time by providing a free secondary school education to the American people, long before other countries did so, and again, on a scale far greater than any others had achieved. And finally, they show how, after the Second World War, we did it yet again, this time leading the world by extending higher education to ordinary Americans, until then a privilege extended in virtually all countries only to their elites. The authors make it very clear that some, especially this country's former slaves, were conspicuously left out of this vast expansion of educational opportunity. But they show in some detail how this uniquely American investment in ordinary people led ineluctably to this country's steadily rising dominance of the global economy through much of the 20th century. But then, Golden and Katz point out, something happened. Following a century-long, ever-expanding extension of educational opportunity in the United States, it all came to an abrupt stop in the 1970s. I invite you to look at the historical education statistics maintained by the United States Department of Education. You will find a chart there that shows the rise in access to education abruptly halting in the 1970s and then leveling off. It has not risen since then, and neither has the American economy. Eventually, productivity, too, stopped rising. And in the long run, productivity growth is the only source of economic growth. When the economy was growing, as we moved into the 70s, the United States had one of the most even distributions of income in the industrialized world. But when access to education stopped growing, and then the economy stopped growing, the way income was distributed among Americans changed. And we now have the most unequal distribution of income in the industrialized world. Golden and Katz make a powerful case that our economy stopped growing and the distribution of income increased in no small measure, the inequalities of, in distribution of income increased in no small measure because we were no longer a world leader in education. Which of course raises the question as to which countries had taken our baton and gotten to the head of the World Education League tables and especially how they got there. First, it's very important to note that the key measure of world leadership in education had been changing over the decades. In the country, in the century or so that the United States had been leading the world, that measure was access, the proportion of the cohort that was in school at the elementary, secondary, and higher education levels. That was the measure on which the United States had excelled year after year for 100 years. But in the years following World War II, many other nations that had been far behind on this measure had actually caught up with us. For a long time, it had been true that they had provided first secondary education and then higher education only for small elites, while we were educating everybody. But by the closing decades of the 20th century, this was no longer true. They had caught up on this crucial measure, and many of them had already surpassed us. But as the 20th century was coming to a close, the game had changed, and we failed to notice. It was no longer just about equity of access. That was assumed in the developed countries with the best education systems. It was now also about quality. That's what is mainly measured by the International Comparative Surveys of Student Achievement. What led to this was the changing terms of global trade. Jobs requiring relatively low skill levels and involving mostly routine work 
were being automated and going offshore at ever-increasing rates, putting ordinary workers with an eighth grade level of literacy at risk of struggling economically for the rest of their lives. But the American education system, the one we have today, as we're sitting here, was designed to produce an eighth grade level of literacy for most school graduates more than a century ago, at a time when a country whose workforce had an eighth grade level of literacy was virtually guaranteed a leading position in the global economy. If you look at the American system with fresh eyes, it's easy to see what we did when we designed the system we have now. Because we only needed a few graduates who could go on to the relatively few colleges that were around at that time, we did not need highly educated teachers, but we needed lots of them. So we built our system around cheap teachers because few graduates would become professionals and top managers, it was perfectly okay to have teachers from low status higher education institutions with undemanding admission standards and an undemanding curriculum. Because we did not need highly educated teachers, we did not have high licensing standards, as we did for occupations where the quality of education training did matter, like medicine, architecture, or engineering. For the same reason, we thought it was perfectly okay to waive our low, low <coughs> standards for teachers in the face of teacher shortages. No one thought that much harm would be caused by having licensed English teachers teaching mathematics when there was a shortage of mathematics teachers. Indeed, it was no big deal if the standards were waived altogether in the face of teacher shortages, so states regularly provide, that word is in the present tense, regularly provide emergency certificates to anyone who can fog a glass in the face of such shortages. The system I just described is the system we have today. And guess what? It's still producing the same results. It is still producing high school graduates, the majority of whom are still educated to an eighth grade level of literacy. We're expecting our schools to produce students with the knowledge and skills needed for the 21st century with an education system designed to perverse, produce a workforce with an eighth grade level of basic literacy. That's the current situation. Our top competitors are riding circles around us because unlike us, they are not expecting the old system to meet an entirely different requirement. They understood years ago that they would succeed in the new glo global economy only if they completely redesigned their education systems to meet a very different challenge. What they had to do, they realized, was to build a system designed to get almost all students to a standard of quality in education that they had up to that time expected only from their elites. And they had to do that without spending much, if any, more money than they had up to that time on the system from which they had expected much less. I will get to the strategies our most successful competitors have turned to in a moment, but before I do that, I want to make a point about the current education reform agenda in the United States. While other countries were realizing that they had to build a new education system to cope with new economic realities, we were getting angry with our teachers and their unions, blaming them for the failures of a system they did not create to accomplish goals for which it was never designed. We set out to blow up the system with market forces, using charters and vouchers as the main instruments of war. We threatened our teachers with dismissal if they did not produce the results we want, using standardized tests of English and mathematics as our sharp knife. Citizens and politicians set out to destroy the teachers' unions, but the teachers did not design a system that depended on the use of cheap teachers. We, the public, did that. They did not decide to waive all the standards for teachers in the face of teacher shortages. We, the public, did that. It was not they who decided to put more money behind the education of students from wealthy families than those who were much harder to educate. It was the rest of us who did that and much more. We were beating up the teachers for failing to dramatically improve student achievement using a system they didn't design, a system that could not possibly do the job. Not one of the top performers are using teacher evaluation systems driven by test-based accountability 
as the drivers of their reform programs. Not one of the top performers is driven by an American-style charter school system. Not one believes that competition among schools will drive their public schools to make the necessary improvements. Not one is trying to reach the top levels of performance through, quote, disruptive change, end quote. That is, by attacking their public school system from the outside, in the hope that challenges to the system will force it to improve. Not one of the top performing countries celebrates alternative routes for people who want to enter the teaching force by making an end run around the institutions most people are expected to go through to become teachers. Not one of them expects technology to make it unnecessary to have first class teachers. Every one of them has staked its future on having first class teachers for all its children. And by the way, all of them spend less than we do per student on their schools. I stand before you to say that the mainstays of the bipartisan American education reform agenda have not worked. None have been used by the growing number of countries that are outperforming us. That's because they cannot work. For starters, we cannot do what has to be done by using cheap teachers who are treated like blue collar workers. It's not going to happen. Let's look for a moment at what the countries with the most successful education systems have done. Instead of recruiting their teachers from the bottom quarter of high school grads, they have recruited from the top quarter. We used to get far better teachers than we deserved because college educated women and minorities had few choices other than teaching. But that's no longer true. Now, finally, we're getting what we deserve, given the compensation and working conditions we are offering. Instead of, making teaching one of the, instead of making teaching one of the easiest careers to pursue in college, our competitors have made it as hard to get into teaching colleges as it is to get into the institution preparing students for high status occupations. Instead of offering a quick way into teaching for those who know their subject, as if anybody could teach, they insist that teachers learn their craft. Some have been moving the preparation of teachers into their research universities. They have greatly raised licensing standards. They knew they could not have done any of this without making the occupation of teaching much more attractive to young people who could easily choose high status professions. So they've been completely restructuring the occupation of teaching, creating real career tracks, making fundamental changes in the way they compensate teachers, using a professional model that rewards increasing teacher competence with more pay, more responsibility, more status as teachers work their way up a steep career ladder, a professional model that creates the possibility of a real career in teaching instead of the prevailing blue collar model. These countries have greatly increased the amount of time available for teachers to work collectively, collaboratively to improve the curriculum, design lessons, create better ways to figure out whether students are learning what they're expected to learn hour by hour and minute by minute. Schools in these countries are being reorganized as professional workplaces with professional cultures so that the professionals are accountable to each other for their performance, working to improve the performance of colleagues who are not pulling their weight and getting rid of those who will not or cannot improve. A lot of effort is going into grooming, recruiting, and training school principals who can play key roles in building and managing these new professional environments. These countries are building powerful, coherent instructional systems set to internationally benchmark standards. They're providing more resources to schools serving students who are hard to educate than they are to schools serving students from more favored backgrounds, the opposite of what we do. There's more to this agenda, but that is, or ought to be, there's more, in one, by the way, one of the things that I have left out here but is truly important is that they all of them are working hard on making sure that when the kids first arrive at the schoolhouse door, they are ready for school. There is more to this agenda. I have not by any means given you all of it, but that's at least enough to give you an idea of what we have to do here in the United States. The question that leaps off the page is why the United States has found it so hard thus far to develop and implement an agenda that all these other countries are following. The first answer is American exceptionalism, the belief that we are different, so different that we have nothing to learn from other countries. You have, I'm sure, heard the whole list. 
We educate everyone and they only educate an elite. Their population is homogeneous while we are a nation of immigrants. We would be listed among the top performers if only we took our poorest kids out of the statistics. You've heard all these. There's a long list of them. Not one of these things are true. Not one is supported by the facts. But large numbers of average Americans, education professionals, and in fact policymakers continue to comfort themselves by denying the validity of these comparisons to other countries. If you don't like the truth, just deny it. And then there are the excuses based on a long list of things that are impossible to do here in the United States. You've heard this list too. We can't fund our schools in a fair and effective way because we will never give up local control. We can't have the state set curriculums as all the other top performers do for the same reason. We can't get competent people to run our state education agencies because the legislatures will never pay them competitive salaries. We can't set higher standards for admission to our teachers' colleges because those colleges are cash cows for the universities of which they are a part. I've spent a professional lifetime listening to an endless list of things that Americans cannot change, while at the same time watching other nations changing the very things we say we can't change. That is the choice that we are making, and I for one am sick of it. Why can a lengthy list of other countries from all points on the compass make such basic changes in their system while we find it impossible to do so? I thought we were Americans. I thought we were famous for being able to do anything we set our minds to. We can continue to insist on American exceptionalism. We can continue to make excuses. If we do that, Corelli Barnett will have turned out to have been quite prescient when he addressed the preface of the American edition of his book to us with the admonition that we could all too easily be another Briton losing our position in the world by failing to listen to those who warned that failure to make fundamental changes in our education system would lead ineluctably to economic decline. I love this country. I'm 74 years old. I should have retired by now and left my organization in the hands of younger people with fresh ideas. But I find I cannot do that. I am desperate to find a way to sound the alarm. This country is pursuing a bankrupt education reform agenda at a time when the path is clear to an effective one. It is not too late. Years ago, when David Kearns left IBM to run the Xerox Corporation, Xerox was the Google of its day. But not long after Kearns arrived to take up his new position, a group of engineers just returned from Japan told him that a tiny company called Ryko was bringing very high quality copiers to market in half the time that Xerox could do it. The price to the consumer of those copiers, including marketing, sales, shipping, and profit, was less than Xerox's cost of production. The engineers said there was no way Xerox could match that. They advised Kearns to sell Xerox to some unsuspecting buyer before the Japanese shut them down. Kearns turned to the engineers and he said, you know, the Japanese put on their pants one leg at a time, just like you do. Go back to Japan, figure out how they do it, and then figure out how we can do it better. The Japanese put many leading American manufacturers out of business, building higher quality machines and selling them at lower prices. But Xerox and many other American firms not only survived, but prospered, getting far stronger in the process. What David Kern said to his engineers holds in this case. There's nothing these other countries are doing in the field of education that we cannot do at least as well as they if we put our mind to it and if we buckle down. But we will have to swallow our pride and find out how they're getting to the top of the world's league tables. And yes, many hallowed features of our system will have to be changed. But American history is a history of one revolution after another. We can do it again. Winston Churchill once said that Americans always do the right thing after they have exhausted all of the alternatives. <laughs> the people in this room are the leaders of American education. The direction we go in is up to you. Please, prove Churchill right. Thank you.